Hello my quilting friends! Leah Day here with a new quilty box video. I just received my quilty box for January 2017 and this time all of the gear has been picked by Stephanie Palmer, a good quilting friend of mine. So it feels super special. So let's check out what came in the box and figure out what we're going to make together this month. So just in case you've never heard of quilty box, basically this is a box of fun gear that arrives every month it's kind of like a magazine subscription, only you get quilt patterns and tools and fabrics, and they're always put together and picked by one quilter. So everything in the box was picked by Stephanie Palmer, and you can find her website at latenightquilter.com. She's also the creator of the Quilters Planner, and I'm so excited that this was included in this box. It's the Quilters Planner Mini. It's a little mini planner, helps you organize your life and your quilting project. So towards the back, you can see we have these charts and graphs and graph paper. So you can plan several quilt projects anytime and it's small enough, it's gonna fit perfectly in your purse. So I'm so, I'm so happy that that's included. It's just terrific. We've also have some quilt patterns here, strip it down, cool strip piecing quilt pattern and pink lemonade. This is super, super cute. And it is included, it's using the um, color of the year from Kona Cotton, that, that kind of bright pink, which is also in our fabric. We'll be opening that up in just a second. So that's awesome. We also have some cool tools here. This is a undo double tip seam ripper. And I've been wanting one of these, so this is super, super awesome. Let's see here, if I pull it or do I twist it? I can't. <laughs> this is this is beyond me. Okay, there we go. You just pull it really hard and that uncaps the one end and then pull it really hard. Ah, so we have a nice big seam ripper on one end and a little baby seam ripper on the other end. Let's see if it'll, I think, I think the more that you click it and unclick it, the easier that will get. So very neat. And then we have Bobini Universal Bobbin Holder. This is always something I'm needing. I always have 50 million bobbins floating around and it's so nice to keep them organized. So let me grab a spool of thread here and a bobbin and see if I can get it to work. So let me look at the package, what the image looks like on the package. Okay, so I think this part goes down into a spool of thread like that and then you just top it with your bobbin, handy dandy. That's awesome. Keep it nice and organized. That way you know which bobbin for which spool of thread and you're not gonna be using mystery bobbins. I'm always ranting about mystery bobbins. It's a pretty much the best way to mess up a quilt is by putting something you don't know into your machine. So that is super ops, op, op. <laughs> so that is super awesome. I am going to definitely be more organized this year with that. So now let's check out our fabrics. Like I said, this is the Kona color of the year. And so they've created this roll up, specially just to emphasize this color, this kind of bright pink. And I think the color name is Pink Flamingo. So that's already giving me some ideas of ways to play with it. And here's the reason why I always unroll these because I know myself really well and I know that if I leave this as a perfect pristine roll up, I will never use it. I have got to unroll it, uh, undo it and make a big mess with it. And that's the only way to guarantee that this is not gonna just be hoarded fabric. And that's the reason why I always shoot a video for these quilty boxes is that I don't want you to hoard fabric either. You know, we get this once a month, it's meant to be used. So let's use it up. We have a lot of this pink. Let's see here, we've got, that looks like nine strips there. And then we've got another nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So we've got 16 pink strips. And then it looks like we've got eight red. And I think we might have another 16 yellow. So this is a nice variety of strips and these you know, three really bright, cute colors. I think we're gonna do something really, really bright and cheerful with this and I can't wait to get started. So I'm gonna turn off the camera and think about this and create a new quilt pattern. And I'll meet you back here when we're ready to create something cool together. So this is our project for this month. I wanna teach you how to do some fussy cutting. And basically what this means is cutting out a specific design or element from fabric 
and then framing it up so that way it creates your quilt block. And so that's what we're gonna do. These are 12 and a half inch quilt blocks. And this fabric is some fabric I just recently designed for spoon flower. And we've got a lot of really cute designs inside. So I'm gonna teach you how to fussy cut, then how to build it up and turn it into blocks, and then how to turn those blocks into table napkins. I'm needing a new set of napkins. So this was win-win all the way around. To get started on our project, First step is to prep up your fabric. You wanna go on ahead and starch and press these strips two times so they're super stiff and really easy to work with. I've also starched and pressed my fabric so that way it's gonna be really easy to work with too. And I've spread it out here over my tabletop so it's nice and flat. And the first step to fussy cutting is to center up your ruler and start figuring out what size and shapes you're gonna cut everything. And I, I will say, for all of these, I'm cutting different sizes. So I have found that a nine and a half inch square works really good over the girl figure. A seven and a half inch square works great over the home sweet home heart and the house shape. That looks really good at seven and a half inches. And an eight and a half inch square works really well for the rainbow. And it's okay to have so many different sizes and shapes. We're gonna work together with all of these different sizes and shapes. It's not gonna be a big deal. So to line this up and to fussy cut it, I like to mark with a water soluble pen first. And this just helps me plan things out. And I, I just generally mark it up so that way I know how it's gonna fit and how that figure's going to um, center up in that square. There's a lot of different methods for fussy cutting. You know, uh, if you have a border print that's basically the same repeating pattern, then you could just use your ruler. You probably wouldn't need to mark it. But for something like this, where we're going for these really big figures uh, cut out of the fabric, I think that this is the better way to do it. So now I'm matching up. I drew a one angle and now I'm matching up and checking the nine and a half inch mark here and lining that up so it's nice and square and I'm marking around it. And once you get your square marked, that's when you can double and triple check that you've lined up the design in the center and it looks real good and you're happy with it. And I'm real happy that we're cutting off a little bit of her hair. That's okay. You know, we're gonna get a little close once the seam allowance is taken away, but I think that looks really good. You're gonna do the exact same thing, just one at a time for each shape. And whenever you have something cut off, let, let's work with this, um, this rainbow right here. You only have part of the shape. You can see it's cut off here on the side. That's no big deal. We can probably still get enough of it to create a block out of it. So with this, I think an eight and a half inch square is really nice. And you just have to kind of eyeball that eight and a half inch mark and just see where that's gonna line up and what it's gonna look like. So I'm lining up the eight and a half inch mark over here, right with the edge of the fabric where it cuts off. And then I'm looking over here and seeing where that's lining up. That's looking pretty good. And then I know that I'm not cutting off too much of my sun or too much of my clouds. I might have cut off a little bit, but it's not too bad. And so that's how I mark when I'm working right on the edge. And you have to go into this knowing that you're gonna end up losing a little bit, little bit of the design, but you have to just figure out well, what is the most important thing for you to maintain? You know, what do you like the best about that design? And what do you wanna make sure is included in it? As I'm lining up this opposite square, I can better see what is included in the shape. And I'm willing to sacrifice the cloud shapes here, as long as I get the at least a big chunk of the rainbow and the sun shape. And that's just me personally, that's just what I like to see. Uh, the clouds, are pretty even if they get cut off because they have that cute design inside of them. So I'm okay with that. So the next step is to rough cut out your pieces. And this is something that I really like a pair of scissors for simply because I'm in such a habit of cutting right across my fabric. It's so, so easy to end up cutting too much or cutting up and completely ignoring these lines I just bothered to make. So uh, I just grab a pair of scissors and I keep those lines in mind and I, cut about a half of an inch around. Now, there are times that I had to uh, basically butt two shapes up against one another. So like right here, uh, this is the top of one figure and the bottom of another. What I'll do is I'll just rough cut both pieces out together 
and use my rotary cutter to cut between them. So that looks good. So now let's take these and actually clean them up and get them ready to use. So the line I'm gonna cut on first is that line that abuts both pieces. I'm just gonna line that up, get it straight, and cut right across. And so now I have two pieces to work with. I'm gonna set one aside and just focus on this one. So I know that this is a seven and a half inch square, so I can just go on ahead and place my ruler seven and a half inch mark on this line I just cut, because I know that line is straight. I can line up the seven and a half inch mark on that line. And this line, this blue line, should be matching up and it's pretty much dead on it. So cut across. So now I have a nice straight strip of fabric and now it's just a matter of lining up and cutting the square out of it. And this is another nice opportunity to double check that your shape is centered up into the middle of the square just like you like it. So this is looking good. And now this final cut, what I did, I just made sure that the cut lines were landing on straight lines across and then now I'm lining up the seven and a half inch mark over here. I'm lining all of that up nice and straight and making my cut. So there we go. We have a cute fussy cut uh, house shape and I'm going to do this with the other shapes as well. So the next step after cutting your pieces is to start cutting the strips and building up your block. And I did this very roughly because all of my squares were a different size. So I just took my strips, spread them out and cut them about a quarter of an inch bigger than my block on both sides. So I would cut two pieces for the top and bottom, just like this. And then just flip them over, take them to the machine and stitch them in place. So here's what it looked like. After I stitched that on, I stitched it on the sides in this case. It doesn't really matter whether you piece it to the top or the bottom, doesn't matter at all. And so now I'm just gonna take it and trim this up. So I'm just lining up my ruler and I'm lining up a straight line here with that seam line I've just stitched. These two seam lines should be running parallel, so I should be able to line up a straight line here and a straight line here, and then I can lop off that extra fabric extending from that strip. Rotate it around and do the same thing. And so in this case, because I know I have a straight line over here, I should be able to line up the seven and a half inch mark plus straight lines on those seam lines. So seven and a half inch mark over here and straight lines, that looks good. And now I can trim it up square. So this is a method that I like to use when, you know, there's a lot of different sizes and shapes of our blocks and to try and write lots of accurate and exact cutting would take a lot of time. And so this is just as easy. You just basically eyeball it and it works out really well and it uses up scraps nicely. So these are leftover scraps from another block. That one looks a little short to me. So I'll grab another strip here. And you know what, just make sure that it's longer than the block by a, at least a quarter of an inch and, and go on ahead and cut off those selvages so they're not there to make it look ugly. And then just piece it on, flip it over and stitch that on with a quarter inch seam allowance and then trim it up again. And it's that simple. You can start with any size shape. To get it to 12 and a half inches, you might need two or three rows of fabric. Just keep piecing until it's bigger than 12 and a half inches and then trim it down to size. And here's a few of my other blocks that I've already completed. So I love the bold colors. I think that they come out really nicely. As you have bigger shapes, like this was seven and a half inches, I ended up only needing a skinny strip out here. So I cut off a lot of fabric, but that's okay. I can use those scraps for another block. I love how these hearts came out. They really remind me of those uh, sweet tarts, you know, the sweet tart candy that says like, be mine. It's almost Valentine's Day, so I don't know. This is just right in my head. So I think this came out really, really cute. You've got a lot of options for what you do with these blocks. You could, of course, piece these together and make a quilt. 
but I don't really need another quilt right now. I really want something cheerful and fun for my dining room table. So I'm gonna show you how to turn these 12 and a half inch squares into napkins. To turn my quilt block into a napkin, I've cut a 12 and a half inch square of white fabric and I'm just placing this over the right side of the napkin and lining up those edges, nice and flat and straight. And so I'm gonna get started stitching here in the middle of one side. I'm gonna stitch maybe three stitches and then back stitch. And I do that to really secure that starting point. And now I'm gonna stitch on down. And I'm just lining up the edge of my quilt block in that white square with the edge of my presser foot here. And you know, you can put your foot down. This is not real exact. You know, it's okay if you veer off the edge a little bit. And we're really just buzzing through it to stitch these two pieces together. So it's, it's not real crucial that this is absolutely perfect. So I'm just gonna buzz all the way around and then I'm going to leave some space open as I finish up this stitching so that way I can turn this right side out. So I'm coming up here and this is where I started stitching and I wanna be careful to leave myself enough space. So I like to put my hand over it and I wanna leave the space of all four fingers that much space. I know that might seem like a lot, but I wanna leave that much because that will allow me enough space to turn this right side out. So I'm gonna clip these thread tails. I'm also going to go in ahead and clip the corners. So here is where my stitching is. It's exactly a quarter of an inch away from the edge. I'm gonna take my scissors and just trim in so it's about now an eighth of an inch away from that stitching line. So now I'm gonna turn this right side out. So I just stick my thumbs into that hole that we left and I reach over and grab the opposite corner and just kind of turn that right side out and stick it through the hole. And then as I tug on that, the whole thing will start to turn right side out. So the next thing I usually reach over and grab the closest corner and kind of shove that through the hole too. <laughs> this is just a method of just kind of forcing things through gently. I should say we're forcing it through, but we're being very gentle and once you get half those two corners through, then the other two are pretty simple. It just starts to kind of come through by itself. You, um, if something feels stuck, you know, gently tug on it the other way and that usually works out fine. So then you get what looks like kind of a mess uh, because of course the fabric was happy going one way and now we're forcing it in the other direction. We're also wanting to push out these corners so they're nice and crisp. So here's roughly what it's gonna look like. And the next step is just to work on these corners and get them nice and flat. And so the method that I like, I like to use a blunt object and stick it in here and, and force those corners out. I just use a pair of scissors and these have a relatively blunt tip. You can also use point turn turners. There's all kinds of like tools and gadgets and stuff that you can use that will do this. Now, if you're being a real perfectionist and really want it perfect, then grab a pen or a needle and hold this right side out and just kind of pick at the fold. You can kind of take the tip of the needle and insert it into that, into those fabrics and just kind of almost tweak them, poke them into submission. I say that a lot in my videos, poke them into submission, make them work. And then you'll end up with a nice pointy turn. So if you're feeling really perfect about it and you really wanna take your time with it and make sure that it's exactly right, then do that extra step. So now I like to go through and I like to finger press just the, um, the two fabrics, that seam line. I like to finger press that just so it's nice and crisp. Uh, if I go through, I find that if I don't do that extra step, a lot of times I'll have a real wavy edge that looks kind of odd. So I finger press first and then I take a hot dry iron and press over that edge next. And I'm just gonna work one side at a time and I'll meet you back here when I, we're ready to work on the side that has the hole on it. So this is the side that has the hole in it. And this is part of the process. Whenever you do a pillowcase bind, obviously you've got to leave a hole in it in order to turn it right side out. And then managing this hole, dealing with it is the last step of the process. 
So the first thing I like to do is get the back nice and straight. So I'm taking a look at that back fabric and I'm making sure that basically from where the stitching stopped to where it started, that that is going to be a nice straight line where that fabric is folded. And I don't do any kind of trimming or anything like that. That way I can eyeball that seam allowance real nicely. And if I can get the back nice and straight, then getting the front nice and straight is really easy because I can just use the back as a guide. So what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of playing with that fold, eyeballing a quarter of an inch, trying to get the fabric folded here so that it is consistent with the rest of the edge of that napkin. And so that looks good. Give it a press. You can also, one thing that's kind of nice is kind of put a little tension on it. Just stretch the fabric ever so slightly right there. And sometimes it will naturally tuck in and fold exactly where it needs to. So now that that is pressed into place and nice and straight, what we're gonna do is we're gonna return to the machine. We're gonna stitch exactly an eighth of an inch away from this edge. We're gonna seal up that hole completely and have a nice finished edge to our napkin. So I'm gonna pull up thread a couple inches above the hole in my napkin. And I do that simply so I'm kind of on the right track. I get comfortable stitching. And then I'm also forming that nice straight line. It's almost like you can't even see that there is a gap in the fabrics right there. That's important too. Now my stitch length here is 1.5 millimeters and I do have my needle set so it's always in the down position which is really helpful. And I am stitching with white thread just simply because I really like the look of it. I think it looks really nice contrasting with the uh, fabric on the surface. And what I'm doing is I'm stitching an eighth of an inch away. I have a little kind of guide, a little bar here in my foot, and it is lining up with the edge of the fabric. Try and zoom in and not get fuzzy on you here. So you can see there's a little bar right here and I'm lining that up with the edge of the napkin. And that is keeping me exactly an eighth of an inch away. Now an alternative foot, if you don't have a foot like this, would be an edge stitching foot, which has a bar down the center, and then you can reposition your needle to get it exactly an eighth of an inch away from that bar. That's a really good foot to have too. Uh, it's really useful to be able to stitch exact distances away from an edge or away from a ditch. That's always really, really nice. So you can see I'm also buzzing through this really quickly. I'm just speedily stitching along here, trying to keep that edge in line with that uh, little uh, guide on my foot, but I'm not too particular about this. This is just top stitching. And once I finish up with that one area where we were feeling, filling in that hole, we were sealing up that hole, you can pretty much do anything else that you want along all of these other edges. You don't even really need to do it, but it would look weird if you only stitched, you know, a little bit of top stitching over that little two inch area. You know, that would look a little strange. So by top stitching all the way around, it really finishes the edge. It makes it look uh, really consistent all the way around. And it, it adds an extra little bit of thread to the edges as well. So it's all good. So here are our finished napkins. And there is one extra step after you do that stitching along the edge. You should go over it and do some form of stitching over the surface. And what this does is it just holds those two layers together firmly. And then when you wash the napkins, they don't kind of puff up and make kind of become a real wrinkly mess. And so with this one, I stitched in the ditch and then around kind of forming a, a little frame around that goddess. So that looks really cute. And this one, I use the decorative stitching on my machine that stands out real nice. I, this is another decorative stitch. It's a very utilitarian stitch that almost, I almost got it seamless through the corners. The corners are kind of the tricky spot to really make it work. Uh, this was kind of a Greek key design. And then I used stars in the corners to try and make it work. I think the best thing to do when it comes to decorative stitching across is just going ahead and stitch it from edge to edge and just let it overlap. And that would probably look even better. And that's what I did with this one. I just used this kind of scallopy de design and I just allowed it to overlap. And I think honestly, this one is one of the best. And then this is a little 
kind of a vine line and it eh, it got garbled up in the corners but hey who cares it looks cute and then you, of course you can also go with the absolute simplest option here i just uh, edge stitched about an eighth of an inch to the inside and an eighth of an inch to the outside of those seam lines so I hope that you have enjoyed learning how to create all of these. I had a lot of fun piecing them with you and I cannot wait to use them uh, during dinner. We always use cloth napkins and I've been needing a new set. So I'm super happy to have these ready to use at the table. So that's it for this video. Yeah, I made seven napkins for the table and then I had a lot of blocks left. So uh, we sewed these together in rows of three, very, very simple, and then just piece those rows together and match seams to create this cute little quilt top. So you can really do a lot with this idea. You can fussy cut your favorite fabrics and then surround them with the quilty box fabrics and really show off some cute prints. You can make napkins, you can make a quilt, you can make a bigger quilt if you wanted to. So there's lots of opportunities for a creative play this month. If you'd like to learn more about Quilty Box and getting a box of fun gear every month to play with, you can check it out in a link below this video. Of course, if you have any questions at all, please post them. I'm here to help you learn more about making beautiful quilts. Until next time, let's go quilts.